we've gotten all kinds of things uh, online, hand delivered. Uh, we've gone into some middle school events and collected a few uh, questions there. And they're great questions, questions that have to deal with how we think as Christians, how we live. But it puts us in a bind because we pastors have to answer some pretty hard questions. You have asked some hard questions. And so maybe we should have uh, named this series, um, We Asked For It. Um, <laughs> each week, a pastor is going to take two to four of these questions and, uh, and try to wrestle with that. And, and the thing is, we can't possibly deal with all the questions. And we won't be able to deal with them in depth. Some of these things would require weeks in a class. And even then, you'd still have questions. So, we're going to do our best, but bear with us. Forgive us. We might need it. Okay? Well, I want to start with a personal question. Do you ever feel under pressure being a pastor? Yes. Like right now. <laughs> My goodness. Central's a diverse church. We're broader than most churches. There's differences in ages, difference in politics, differences in maturity in the faith, differences even in theology. And the pastor can't speak for everyone. And on top of that, I'm supposed to bring God's perspective to bear on issues. And yet I'm broken. I have my biases. I have my problems. And so, you know, it, it gets to be a pretty heavy burden sometimes. And so, yes, to whoever asked that question, it was a middle schooler, I do feel pressure. Now, I want to move on now to questions two and three. I'll deal with three questions, really four, but two of them come together. And the second section deals with uh, human sexuality. The first, uh, and, and so parents know that, you know, I'm going to be dealing with human sexuality right now, so. Um, why are men in Bible times allowed by God to have more than one wife at a time, but now it's illegal? Well, let me begin with a Bible verse that shapes my thoughts. It comes from the book of Mark, chapter 10. And it begins at the sixth verse. It's the words of Jesus as he deals with the issue of divorce. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So when Jesus was asked a question about divorce, in a society where divorcing a woman often put her into extreme poverty, and she didn't have the right, at least in Jewish society, to divorce back, when Jesus was asked about this, he went back to the story of creation so that we could see what was God's intention for humans in life. And so he quotes and deals with parts of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And the main point is, is that marriage and sex in general were created by God to be one man, one woman for life. And when this goes well, there's deep emotional and physical satisfaction in the relationship. There's long-term uh, long companionship. There's financial security. It's a great place to give birth and raise children. And it's even protection from some diseases. That's when it goes well. The problem is it doesn't always go well. And the Bible deals with that too. It's called sin. It has to do with our selfishness. It has to do with our brokenness. 
And one of the deepest ways sin affects the world is in how men treat women. We see it all over the news right now. It's, it's disturbing. But it's been like that for most of history. In many cultures, at many times, women were considered property. They had very few rights. They weren't allowed any education. And so that meant that they had no capacity to support themselves apart from being in a marriage. Now, in a world like that, women were traded around for financial or political reasons. Kings would marry the daughters of other kings in order to uh, build alliances. Rich men would gather wives to secure deals or to show their power. Now, none of this was right. And yet, God allowed it in Israel. Why? I think one of the things we have to look at is how God generally deals with the world. Usually, when God confronts the world, on the one hand, he presents righteousness, truth, the ideal, what it's supposed to be. And at the same time, God presents grace, forgiveness, patience with the way things are. And so that's what's going on. God doesn't fix everything all at once because to fix everything all at once does something to us that destroys a part of our humanity. We have to cooperate. So what Jesus is doing in Mark 10 is declaring the ideal, declaring the standard, declaring God's intention. One, what life should be like. One man, one woman for life. And in saying this, he lays a standard for not treating women like possessions. And he also lays the foundation for understanding why divorce, premarital sex, sexual slavery, violence, abuse, coercion, sexual harassment are all different than God's intention for us. But he doesn't crack down and fix everything all at once. And so we see that happening in Israel. Let me give an example of what it looks like. We as the church have to be patient too and not try to fix everything all at once. Missionaries went into Africa and they saw polygamous societies and they said that when you became a Christian, it's clear that God doesn't intend those sorts of marriages. So you have to get rid of all of but one of your wives if you become a Christian. And so what that meant was that the wives who were released were released into poverty or prostitution. God is patient and works with what is. We need to be patient and work with what is on any issue. Across time, Christian influence in Western culture has led to the laws we have today that support monogamy. That's the law of the land. But as our culture moves farther from its Christian base, I think we will see those issues revisited and maybe some changes made. And so that brings me to my third question. It's actually two questions, asking about same-sex relationships. The first is, what are the scriptures that condemn or support homosexuality? And the second question is, God, does God love LGBTQ people? Short answer to the second question is, yes. God does love LGBTQ people. And we'll get into more details as we go on. But I've got to give you some caveats as I try to deal with this right now in a sermon. In a short sermon, I can't possibly deal with all the issues in this subject. So you're going to see some gaps and weaknesses. And you need to understand that what I'm presenting to you is primarily a presentation of what I understand on this issue. I'm trying to be faithful to the basic stance and teaching of, of Central, but I know that there are individuals in leadership in the church and in membership of the church that would disagree with part of what I'm going to be saying now. 
That's where we are right now as a culture. Right now, real Christians, thoughtful Christians, are disagreeing on something as important as this. And it's going to be like this for a long time. You also need to understand my heart a little bit. I live in the real world just like you. I have a member of my family who's gotten a sex change operation, and I'm on good terms with her. I have a gay member of my family. My second best roommate in college was gay. My best roommate was Debbie because we got married in college. <laughs> I have another lifelong gay friend who leads an international ministry to gay people who are choosing to live celibate lifestyles. I also have friends who are gay or lesbian and who are living in same-sex marriages. I approve, I agree with the choices of some, and I disagree with the choices of others. But in all of these cases, I have warm, respectful relationships. We can talk. We can live together. We can love each other. Now, I'd love to be able to say that how we handle our sexuality is just a matter of personal choice, live and let live. If I were making the rules, that's what I'd make the rules. That is, at least according to me, would be live and let live. But I can't. When I became a Christian, I came under authority. As a Christian, I believe that what we do with our lives is not just a matter of personal choice, but a matter of God's intentions for human life, no matter what the issue is. And I get an understanding of that from the Bible. Now, there's a number of verses, but it's very few, that deal with the issue of homosexuality directly. There's eight in particular, and I'm just going to list them up on the screen right now in case you wanted to look at that on your own. On the other side of the equation, there are no verses that specifically support same-sex relationships in the Bible. There's a number of general passages on love and on grace that are frequently used by people in discussions, uh, the people who support same-sex marriage. But the main verse for me, as I try to wrestle with this, is not these verses, but the same verse that I used earlier about polygamy, and that is Jesus pointing to the cre creation story as God's intention for human life. God created our sexuality to be lived a certain way, and so every other way, polygamy, polyandry, polyamory, sex outside of marriage, divorce, open marriage, same-sex relationships, and more, are all short of God's intention, of his ideal. And people in heterosexual marriage aren't off the hook either because God talks about our attitudes, about our thought processes. It confronts pornography, it confronts fantasy. And even within relationship, you can try to use other people. All of this is confronted. We all fall short of the glory of God. This is my conviction. It's shaped by a fairly careful study of Scripture. But I keep on reading people on all sides. I will take seriously anybody who's trying to take the Scripture seriously, even if they come out with different answers. And even if I disagree, I'm learning all the time. You know, it might take another 50 years before the church worldwide has a broader agreement on how new discoveries in science, secular politics, and scripture interact over this issue of sexuality. But it would be my hope that along the way, the scripture would be, the, the church would be wrestling with scripture as well and not just writing it off. I'm under the authority of scripture as I think about this issue. But I'm also under the authority of Scripture in how I treat people as we work through this issue. 
The Bible has a lot more to say about how we treat each other when tensions come up than on the issue of sexuality directly. So it's my intention all along the way to hum handle myself as a humble participant in a broken church, in a broken world, filled with broken people who are broken just like me. I will have my convictions, but I'll defend the rights and needs of people with whom I disagree. Right now, the number one cause of homelessness among teens is children being thrown out of their homes when they come out of the closet. This is wrong. If people have lifelong relationships, they need to be able to go to hospitals and have the, the, the right to visit. They need insurance protection. And I will defend these things. I will have my convictions. But I'll be open to learning more as well. And I have learned more along the way. There's been all kinds of talk of how the original cultures are different than our culture. We're talking about some things differently. I've learned from that. It hasn't moved my position. But I understand more the realities of what the situation is really like. And if the word of God shows the way, I'll change myself. I want to end with a bit of uh, instructions on how to treat each other along the way since this is such an important issue. Three more scriptures up on the screen for your own study. 1 Corinthians 13, Galatians 5, James 3. Talking about love, talking about the fruit of the Spirit, talking about heavenly wisdom. All of these tell us to be humble, patient, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, loving, kind, peace-loving. And the reason why they tell us that is because that's what godliness looks like. Not angry yelling. Not ignoring people. Not shaming people. Right now, this is an issue on both sides of the equation. of People shaming other people. People losing jobs for single times that they say something that's ill-chosen. We need to be careful. And so taking that mindset, let me give you a few practical bits of, of advice. Drop the attitude that you have to fix everybody. That'll make your life a lot simpler. You are not the Holy Spirit. News. Makes life simpler. God is responsible to change people. Your job is to be lovingly, faithfully present with people. And for you, that might mean being lovingly, faithfully present with a gay nephew. It might be, mean being lovingly, faithfully present with that Bible-thumping uncle who just doesn't get it. So. Drop the attitude, you have to fix everybody. Second one, you don't always have to make your position clear up front out of fear you're going to be endorsing something. You know, it's like walking into a bar to get a drink, and you walk in, you stand at the front door, and you say, hey, folks, I'm getting a drink, but I am against public drunkenness. I just want you to know that before I come in. We don't always have to declare everything up front. Let's just love people and be with people. And, and then in relationship, let truth be communicated one to another. Another one. You don't always have to fear that hanging around with someone who thinks differently than you will taint you. Folks, that's Old Testament thinking. In the Old Testament, you always had to worry about whether you were encountering something that would make you unclean, someone with a skin disease, some, a, a, a dead person. But in the New Testament, Jesus boldly walks into places that would, would normally be considered unclean because by the power of the Holy Spirit, God can take what's unclean and make it clean. And so he sends out Jews into a Gentile world 
full of idolatrous people who are making unspeakable decisions about their lives in all kinds of ways. Because Jesus had the confidence that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the church would actually change the world. Talks about the gates of hell not standing against the world. That's not a defensive posture where we are going to be able to hold off things. No, it's an offensive picture where the gates of hell cannot stand against the church moving forward. So on whatever the issue is, God's truth will ultimately assert itself and bring freedom into people's lives. And so we don't need to rush all of this. And we don't have to worry about being tainted. We just need to love and support and be honest. The final one is remember the rule of three. What the rule of three means is there are almost never two positions only on anything. There's always a third option or more. People are always trying to force us into for or against on whatever political issue. And on this issue of sexuality, are you for homosexual marriage or against? Well, what do you mean by that? Uh, for or against? Let's take against. On against, do you mean that homosexuality is an abomination before God and people should be stoned or put into prison? There are countries where that is the position. Is that what you mean? Or is it on this side, anything goes? It doesn't matter. Nothing is off the table. Is that what you mean? Or is there some other kind of position? Maybe you're not in that position, but you feel like there's a danger there. And you want to have laws and rules in the church to protect society from the dangers of same-sex attraction. On this side, you say, no, it's not anything. I mean, come on. It's only adult consent. Anything that adults can, without coercion, agree to. And it's only those things we're talking about. And this is broader than same-sex. This is about all of sexuality. So... You know, polyamory, you know, open marriage, any of these things. Or maybe it's not any of those positions. Maybe your position is that it's brokenness. Just like other brokenness in our lives. And people need to be loved and supported and helped as they invite it. And even if they don't change, we will continue to love folks. Is that what we mean? And on the supportive side, do you mean only same-sex relationships that are long-term commitments and faithful, monogamous? Now, the real surprise for me, well, first of all, the question is, where are you on the spectrum? Or is there another position in between one of these? See, the fact is, there is a spectrum. There are differences. And what I discovered is that once I laid it out this way, I found out that I was closer to the position of the presbytery on this than I was to Uganda, which is one of the countries that at certain times in its history has had this position. So sometimes looking for what the middle ground is isn't compromise. It's clarity. Be clear about what you believe. And then I would exhort you to submit that to the challenge of Scripture. Now, it's going to be messy ahead in our society and in the church. Nothing's going to resolve quickly. And the way I'm going to handle this is like I try to handle every important issue. I'm going to try to hold on to Scripture as my authority in the issue, but also hold on to Scripture as my authority on how I treat people 
along the way as we still disagree. Both of these points are vital. And I think that for us, we need to understand how vitally important it is how we treat each other in the church while we continue to disagree. No matter which side of the issue you happen to be. Now, that's it for this week. And I hope it's easier on pastor number two. <laughs> Let's pray. I'd like to invite you to just have a moment where you reflect and pray about whatever's on your mind as we listen to this together. Lord, we come to you. We come to you with our hopes. We come to you with our fears. We come to you with our convictions. We come to you with our weaknesses. In all of this, we invite you, since we believe that you are the Lord, we invite you to work in our lives. We invite you to draw us into Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.